it was 11 years ago this week that I took our Bible study on a mission trip to the Dominican Republic. It was a four and a half day trip and we worked at a feeding center. Uh, we did construction work at a church. We also had some worship services. It was a great trip. But if you know anything about uh, Cuba or the Dominican Republic, everything in those places revolve around the sport of baseball. I mean, everything. And so the last day of a mission trip, what they always do is they have the church group come up with a softball team and you play against the nationals. You play against the Dominicans. And they love to play because they never lose, right? <laughs> and they were undefeated for six years. And so we were very excited about this. And you need to know, I have numerous weaknesses in my life, but one of them is that I am overly competitive, all right? And so we were in the midst of the game, we were halfway through it, and somehow we had a slight lead. But at that moment, our third baseman made an errant throw, and it went sailing past our first baseman, and there was a group of our girls from the mission trip that were seated there. And this thing had some velocity on it. And it went right into where the girls were. They split like the Red Sea, but one girl, sweet, kind-hearted Ann, the softball just was as a radar right to her face and it smacked her right in, in the middle of her face and blood went everywhere. It was, it was terrible. We stopped, everybody went over. They got, somebody got her a towel in a matter of a couple of, uh, of, of minutes. It was, it was red as could be. Now, Anne was a nurse and uh, she knew that her nose was broken and she had the courage and the wherewithal to go and she popped it back over and moved it from the side of her cheek. And then they pulled out a station wagon, an old station wagon, and they put her in the back of it. And we all made a circle around it and we prayed for her and they took her off to the hospital. Our girls started crying. Uh, guys came up to me and said, man, I, I don't think we can finish this game. One of the guys came up to me and said, boy, you know, I, I, I don't feel like playing anymore. And then somebody said, what do you think, Dave? <laughs> well, I'm thinking, we got the lead, you know? <laughs> I mean, we got a chance here, right? And I knew if we just called the game right then that the Dominicans would say, oh, no, we didn't finish the game. We had runners in scoring position. We had a big rally coming up. And, and so I knew we had to finish the game. And so I'm thinking, what am I going to say? And one guy looks up at me, and we're in this circle, and he says, Dave, should we stop? And I just want to apologize to you right now for what I'm about to say, all right? <laughs> but I thought for a second and I kind of bit my lip and I looked back at him and said, you know what? I think that Ann would want us to play. <laughs> I think Ann wants us to go on. And then I said, I've got an idea. Let's dedicate this game to Ann, <laughs> all right? Put your hands in the middle, one, two, three, and. One, two, three, and, boom. We won 11 to seven, all right? So the competitive people clap, I understand that, right? What's sad is I struggle to remember my anniversary date, but I can tell you the score of a ball game over a decade ago, you know? Well, that night we gave the game ball to Ann, we even all signed it for her, and uh, yeah, I know. Uh, two days later, she had surgery in Louisville to repair three broken bones in her nose, and in no time, she was as good as new, and uh, here she is afterwards, and, and even after all of that, Anne would tell you that that mission trip was the best trip that she had ever been on. Now, those who are highly competitive would hear that, and they would say, well, you made a wise decision to finish that game. And there are others of you who are more empathetic and you have high mercy gifts who might say, oh, that, that was a foolish decision. Now, I don't know which person you are because everyone comes to the game with a different perspective. And what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount might seem too countercultural or too outlandish for some. For others, it may seem too old-fashioned or too difficult or, or too foolish but all of Christ's teaching was designed to deepen us and to give the game of life purpose and meaning. And this week, we're going to conclude our, our series on the Sermon on the Mount, where we have been calling it after further review, because we, we talk about the way of Jesus. 
and how it looks different than the way of the world. And it causes us to step back and to review the game film of our lives and see if it matches up with what Jesus says a life lived with him should look like. And the thing about game film is that it gives us a new angle, a fresh perspective. It helps us see where we've gone wrong and it also allows us to make the adjustments necessary to keep moving. Your coach might say to you at a critical point in the season, you're gonna have to ask yourself some hard questions. Are you willing to prepare? Do you have what it takes? Are, are, are you a type of person that wants to win badly enough? And when it comes to the game of life, regardless of how competitive you are, you're gonna wanna win this one because it has eternal consequences for each of us. Today, I wanna extract five different questions out of this passage in Matthew chapter seven that concludes the Sermon on the Mount. And I hope that these questions, as we ask them of ourselves, will reveal whether or not we're, we're truly following Christ. Question number one, which path are you traveling on? What, what's the road that you're on? Where, where is it heading? Matthew chapter seven, verses 13 and 14, Jesus is speaking here. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now, our tendency is to want to follow the crowd, and we see everybody going this broad path and down this broad road. Let's, let's all go there and just follow everyone else. But Jesus wants us to move in another direction. It was the American poet Robert Frost who said, two roads diverged in the woods, and I, I took the road less traveled by. And that has made all of the difference. And Jesus says, the way to life is found through a narrow gate that is hard to find, but wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many people will find that and enter that. Now, I know that might sound rather harsh on the surface, because on one, one side of things, Jesus is the best. He is the easiest yes that you'll ever have. But at the same time, you need to be reminded that the way of Jesus is not a piece of cake or a can of corn or a cup of joe. Living for Christ is difficult. And while salvation is a free gift from God, there is nothing you can do to earn your salvation. But entering the narrow gate is costly by the world's standards. It is a, a constant daily decision to dig down deep to the heart of what Jesus is saying and actively trust that his ways are better than ours. And maybe that's why the Bible teaches that we, we can't bring stuff with us to heaven. Job said in Job chapter one, verse 21, he said, naked did I come into the world, naked will I depart. And long before we leave earth, God wants us to declutter ourselves and unattach ourselves from the things of this world. To simplify to the point that what we have or what we keep is for the purpose of building relationships or reaching out to others. And so you use your home to that advantage. You use your resources to help others. You use your time and your extra time that you might have to try to pour and make a difference into those around you. Jesus says the gate is narrow. In other words, we can't bring anything with the world with us. We can't bring along with us and fit it through that narrow gate, our, our good deeds. We can't bring our, our religion, our, our religiosity. We can't bring our spiritual accomplishments. We can't bring our hidden sin. We can't bring the baggage from our past. The gate is narrow. And the only thing that we can bring is ourselves. That's it. And that's all he asks. Question number two. Who are you listening to? Who has your ear? Who is it that has your attention? And Jesus gives a word of warning here. And he begins in verse 15. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? What's he talking about there? Well, back in that agrarian culture, there was a type of thorn bush that from a distance resembled a cluster of grapes. And so you might be walking, see that in the distance, say, oh, great, there's some grapes up there, I can get some. No, those aren't grapes, that's a thorn bush instead. 
And the same was true with uh, thistles at a particular time of year in the Middle East. When you look at them, they might resemble figs, but, but they're not. And Jesus is saying, the closer you get, you're going to be able to see if a person truly is a faithful servant of God. And so he says, watch out for false prophets, but you've got to take a look more closely. Is God's word their source of truth? Have they claimed something that God would not teach or God did not espouse? Is there a consistency in their life and their teaching? Do they seem more consumed with making their name famous or the name of Jesus famous? Who gets your attention? What podcasts do you listen to? What pastors do you allow to have a voice into your life? What musical messages do you listen to over and over again? What video games do you play? What do you watch on Netflix? Are these things that increase your ability to share your faith with others and have a conversation with those around you? Or do they plant negativity? Or do they inspire impurity? Let's widen the application. As a Christian, take a look at the next three verses. And we begin with, with verse 17. It says, likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Question number three, what fruit are you bearing? What type of crop are you producing? What do others see as a byproduct of your life? And the answer to what fruit you are bearing depends on what it is that you're planting because you will sow what what you reap. There's never a surprise in the process. I mean, there can't be. No farmer comes into their house and scratches their head and says to their spouse, honey, it's the craziest thing. We planted apple seeds, but that one row of trees is producing oranges. No one would ever say that. That would be ridiculous. You get what it is that you're seeking, what it is that you've planted. And there is a subtle challenge that Jesus slides in that I don't want you to miss. Let's look at verse 19 again. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That could be a reference uh, to whether or not you as a Christian are bearing good fruit. So ask yourself if the fruit of the Spirit Those nine qualities that are talked about in Galatians chapter five, verses 22 and 23, if the fruit of the spirit, those nine qualities are in your life and are they visible in your family tree? Do your children display those godly characteristics because you passed them down? Are you pouring into someone? Maybe there's someone at work that's new to the profession or new to the business. Could you take them under your wing and just pour into them? And in so doing, they would pick up some of the fruit of the spirit that they see in your life. Or maybe it's a student in our community who desperately could use a mentor or a young couple who's starting out and could just use some help in their marriage. But there's another application to be made here as it pertains to passing our faith on to others and inviting others into this relationship with Christ. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus says, for the son of man came to seek and save what was lost. That's why he came. That was his mission in life. It would be, it would be to, to make certain that everyone he comes in contact with, he's trying to somehow bring them closer to the kingdom. And if that was his purpose, we would be wise to embrace that as ours as well. You remember a time in, in, I think back in Matthew 21, there's this time where Jesus and the disciples, they're they're out walking somewhere and they see a, a fig tree in the distance and they were probably hungry and so they probably were kind of excited over this. And so the closer they came to it, they realized that, that there were no figs on it, it was just leaves. And so Jesus condemned the tree. You say, well, that, that sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? But he didn't condemn the tree because it was old. He didn't condemn the tree because it was gnarled. He didn't condemn the tree because it was unattractive compared to the other trees around. He condemned the tree because it failed to produce fruit. 
And one of the signs of a mature Christian is that they are reproducing themselves in the lives of others. And Jesus is echoing in this moment in Matthew 21, his words from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down. Sometimes you hear us say, sometimes you, you hear it said in the baptistry, well, we, we wanna make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. We just want it to continue. This is an ongoing part of the Christian life and we need to continue to share with others. And if we produce good fruit, they will be more likely to follow your example and do the same because a sign of health and maturity in a church and in a Christian is when they're reproducing their life and pouring into someone else. Question number four, you with me? Question number four, whose plan are you pursuing? Whose plan are you pursuing? In this next section, I just have to tell you, it is extremely sobering because Jesus is in the last few paragraphs of this incredible sermon that he's given and he's setting up the ending. And right now he's just gonna go for the jugular and he is, he's gonna get everyone's attention in this crowd with verse 21. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Jesus was sickened by hypocrisy when people appeared to be something that they weren't. And so Jesus, in these closing paragraphs of, of the Sermon on the Mount, he is setting up his conclusion. He's, he's getting at them saying, we, we think that we will be saved. You think that you'll be saved because of your heritage, because of your deeds, because of the way you serve, because of the way you teach, the way you preach, because of the way you give, because of the way you lead. But those actions in and of themselves do not give us a golden ticket to heaven. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying it is possible for us to become so involved in the work of the Lord that we forget the Lord of the work. To become so wrapped up in serving that we overlook the Savior. I want you to look at this for just a second on the screen and just let it, let it soak and, and sink in for just a minute. You may know about Jesus. You may talk about Jesus. You may skillfully use his name to enlarge your network of business contacts. But is there a personal relationship with him? I'm telling you, that's what it all comes back to. Do you have a personal walk, a personal relationship with Christ? Are you cultivating that? Hey, I don't want to go through this life and then someday stand before the Lord and, and beg and try to impress him with my Christian accomplishments only to have him look at me and say, I, I never knew you. Get out of my sight. The only way that could happen is if we're trying to advance our agenda and not his. And these verses are a scathing rebuke of hypocrisy and a subtle rebuke of the religious leaders of that time whose motives were more self-serving than they wanted to let on. So right before his closing uh, paragraph, Jesus addressed people who say they believe, but they never do anything to bear fruit or to show their beliefs. So to everyone else, they say God's word is the truth, but they don't let it shape their life the way they should. Or they say Jesus is the way to life, but they never bother to tell anyone about Jesus. Or they say all the right things, but they don't actually live them out. And Jesus has strong words. I never knew you. May we never hear those words. Question number five, our, our fifth and final question. We'll spend a little more time unpacking this. Question five, what are you building on? And Jesus is going to close out his most famous discourse with a story, one that the crowd would be able to picture in their own mind in that setting. And so he begins in verse 24. I'll just read it straight through. It's just four verses. Here's his story. He says, therefore, in other words, in light of everything that I've just shared with you, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. The end, mic drop, and he heads off on the mountainside. It is sometimes easy to read this text and assume that Jesus is making a distinction between believers and non-believers here, but he's actually not. He's talking to those who believe, and he's dividing that camp into two different categories. He's making an emphasis of those who believe, and he says in this section, he says there are people who hear the words of Jesus, but they never do anything differently. He would be saying to us today, he would be saying, you hear the sermons, you read the books, you do the Bible study, you listen to the Christian music, but do you put it into practice? The faithful pew attender whose heads are filled with knowledge, but their hands are soft with a lack of action in their Christian lives. You know, wherever you live, if you live in a house or a a condo or an apartment or a cabin, wherever you might live, your foundation of where you you stay is really important. I mean, especially with how wet our our winter has been, it, it becomes very, very important. What we do here in America typically is we, when something is built, they dig down a little bit and they, they hope that they hit some rock, not too much, but a little. And if you've ever built a house, you know that's what that foundation is gonna be on. But if you've ever built a house, you've also gotten that phone call from your builder and your builder says, hey, I got some good news and I got some bad news. You say, well, what's the bad news? Builder says, we, we hit rock. And he said, we hit, hit a lot of rock. In fact, I think there was a quarry here a few decades ago, right? And you're gonna have to pay to have us break it up and, and get it out of here. He said, well, what's the good news? He says, the good news is we hit rock. He said, when it rains, if there's flooding, your house isn't gonna go anywhere because it's built on a firm foundation. In Jesus' time, they would dig through the layers of soil until they hit solid rock. But some would opt for a shortcut. Less work, less money, less effort. Besides, the sand in Galilee appeared so hard in the summertime, it was almost like a rock. But in the winter, when the rains would come and the Jordan River would swell, the sand would loosen and a collapse was inevitable. But the wise builder looked to the future and knew the storms would come. The wise builder counted the cost and put time, energy, and effort into digging a deep foundation to the bedrock. While the foolish builder was only concerned with the outward appearance of the house. So he did not take time to to dig the foundation for his house. He didn't count the cost. We are a culture that thrives on the outward appearance. We are much more concerned with what is above ground than what is below the surface. We're more concerned with the show than we are the substance. And as a result, we have seen plenty of implosions and free falls of those that we put on pedestals. Whether it is a politician or a preacher, whether it is a celebrity or an athlete, if the foundation isn't secure, it's only a matter of time before the collapse will come. Back years ago when I, I, I came to Southeast, uh, I was 27 years old. I, I hadn't played much golf in my life, but I, I made some friendships in the church and all these guys seemed to really like to play golf. And so I started kind of learning how to play golf. And my first couple of years, I really kind of got hooked on it and addicted to it. And one day I was out playing with uh, an older gentleman in our church. He was about 70 years old. His name was Bill Etzcorn. And Bill's gone on to be with the Lord uh, now, but uh, he teed off. He was in the middle of the fairway. He only went about 160 yards. And I, I teed off, and I was young and limber back then. I hit it about 220 yards, and I thought, man, a lot. This is not even gonna be close. And it wasn't. He beat me by 10 shots. 
Because I could hit a 220, you just never knew where that 220 was gonna be, right? And I learned something that day because every time, although he could only hit it 150 or 160 yards, he always hit it right down the middle. He hit it wherever it was that he aimed. And I learned an important truth that every golfer eventually discovers. Direction is more important than distance. Now, if you're a spectator, it's much more exciting to see somebody hit it really far. And we think, oh, that's really cool. But that doesn't win tournaments. And the same is true when a person first comes to faith. As they begin to interact with Christians in the church community, at first they notice the behavior of mature Christians. What they do and and what they don't do. And that stands out to the new believer. But eventually you begin to realize that the outward actions are merely a reflection of an inner commitment. And just as direction is more important than distance, beliefs are more important than behavior. Your behavior is an outgrowth of your beliefs. What you truly believe will emerge in your actions. It reveals the areas you have or have not really made Christ the Lord and master of your life. You see, it's much easier to say no to something if there's a stronger burning yes within you. And when you have that burning belief inside of you, you can say no. Your beliefs shape your behavior. And if you get your beliefs right, then the right actions will become more natural. And if you want a firm foundation, then dig deep and concentrate on your beliefs. The problem is that some people say, well, that's too costly. I'd rather build on the sand. It's a lot quicker and it's a lot easier. And you got to admit, the house looks pretty good. But Jesus says, go deep. He says, why don't you get in in a group with some other people? Why don't you get in a group where you can dig into the heart of what it really looks like to follow me? Some of you need to dig deep into your past. Maybe you need to see a counselor or talk to a friend and begin walking through some of the things that that, that you've gone through that have disguised or distorted or damaged your view of Jesus. Be willing to go deep into the messiness of your life and watch the way God begins to reveal himself to you. Dig deep into his word. Get involved in a Bible study. Study God's word on your own. Ask God to help you. Build a life that is unshakable and undefeated. How do you do that? It's by going deep. And many people say that they struggle with knowing what what God's will is for their life. And while I think that that is a valid concern for some, I think that the overwhelming majority of us struggle in another way. We know what, what God wants us to do. We know what he asks us to do. We just struggle in choosing to do it to crucify our selfish desires, to choose to humbly submit to what he wants us to do, to make the countercultural choice to put him on the throne, to obey his word and his will rather than making choices that satisfy our cravings and please ourselves. Someone has said that the distance between heaven and hell is 18 inches. From your head to your heart. And you hear something And you just don't know if you can embrace it in your heart. You know in your mind you should do it. But in your heart you choose to do what you want to do. Oh how our lives would be totally different if we chose to build on a firm foundation. Rooted in biblical beliefs. Based on Christ's teaching. Heaven is for those. Jesus says heaven is for those who do the will of the Father. Not for those who know about God or can talk about God or or can tell others about God. Heaven is for those who do God's will. They choose to lay aside everything that entangles them. They willingly drop those things off and they choose the narrow gate over the broad gate. And one of the most frustrating things in ministry is having people who, who read God's word and they dive into it and they listen to sermons, and they nod approvingly, and then when they leave, they do whatever they choose to do. I am convinced that the best kindling wood for the fires of hell are the logs in the eyes of Christian hypocrites. And we can preach the gospel, and we can come to church, and we can tout our faith, but until we begin altering our own actions and practicing what we preach, our unsaved friends will continue to march straight to hell, perhaps with us right at their heels. A genuine faith 
requires a willingness to change. It's not just hearing the word. It's doing the word. And I encounter a lot of Christians who feel just the opposite of the title of this message. They feel defeated. They've allowed Satan to to get the best of them. And so they dwell on their weaknesses and their past mistakes and their defeats. But thank God that the Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, he says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he, meaning Jesus, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The cross. What appeared to be Jesus' greatest defeat was actually his greatest victory. He disabled and disarmed the devil's dart of death. Death can have no power over us anymore because Christ has conquered the grave after allowing himself to be killed. This is not just a a verse that is victorious. This is a verse that is, is visionary. This is not just a truth from that moment on the cross. It is a truth for you to take hold of today. Christ has won. And regardless of how it may look at times, Jesus Christ is still winning and he is undefeated. And therefore, when we live like him and with him, nothing can defeat us. So it's time to do something about it. What's it gonna be? The broad road that leads to destruction or the narrow path that leads to eternal life. The choice is yours. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I uh, freely admit of times when I've chosen to do what I want to do and not what you want me to do. And I've taken the easy road and the broad road and kind of slopes downhill and the longer you're on it, the easier it is to stay on it. Lord, would you help me and help us to make choices that honor you? May we not just hear your word and hear your will, but may we be doers of the word as well. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.